So welcome to the gaze, and I'm glad to be with you on a digital platform of New Europe, platform where we will show all the significant events in different regions that at the end of the day affect the world globally, and we will speak about it with our experts for you. I'm Ksenia Smirnova, and it's my show, Talk for More Details, and today we will speak about counteroffensive and um, weapon supply for Ukraine, and we will talk about this with Glenn Grant. Uh, the retired British lieutenant, Colonel, uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for your time for our channel. And uh, for the very beginning, I want to add some more information for our discussion, if you don't mind. Please do. So James Happy, uh, Britain's Minister of State of the Armed Forces, announced uh, the Ukraine's offensive was meeting expectations and going according to plan, as reported by The Telegraph. Happy emphasized that the armed forces are advancing cautiously through dense Russian minefields. Uh, he also said that the Ukrainians have enough firepower uh, to break through the enemy front. So let us talk for more on the current situation on the battlefields in general and Ukrainian counteroffensive in particular. So the Ukrainian counteroffensive is far from a failure, even though it is progressing more slowly than planned, stated the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, General Mark Milley. The main problem causing Ukrainian casualties right now is minefields, uh, not uh, Russian aircraft. That's what Miley said. So my question is, can we objective naming minefields as the only and the main reason for the loss of the combat strength of the Ukrainian army? And why does the difference, uh, we have still the difference in the assessment of the obvious reasons for uh, the slow advance of the counteroffensive by Ukrainian and by Western experts that remain unchanged? Oh, that was a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say the first thing is you can't, you can't, uh, I'm going to say lay the blame uh, for, for, for anything on the offensive to any one factor. Because, because the, the, a, a defense by, by Russia is, is, a, is a complex, a complex organ, a complex animal in many ways. And so, you know, yes, you've got mines and you've got lots of mines, but you've got trenches, you've got people, you've got air support, you've got artillery. And it's how these are all used together and how they're actually working together that actually makes the defense uh, either good or bad. Um, so, you know, it, you can't go easily into minefields, for example, if uh, if the enemy has got good surveillance over you. But if they haven't got good surveillance over you, you can take your time, you can lift the mines, and you can go through. Um, if they've got long-range weapons, then, then they can sit further back. And that makes it much more difficult for attacking forces because they have to go further in the open before they actually reach... Uh, trenches and trench lines. So it's this combination of things. And, you know, even a trench, if it's badly placed, it's of no use. Um, if it's well placed, then it can be a really significant, uh, well placed and with good people inside, it can be a significant obstacle, uh, as we saw that in the First World War, that, you know, trenches with wire were significant things and often took tens of thousands of people to break through trench lines. So, you, you just can't blame one thing. And, and I think that, that in many ways, that's, it's foolish of Miley to try and suggest that it's, it's uh, mines are more important than air cover. Or, because they're not. They're all, they're all there and they're all attacking the Ukrainians. What is interesting is that the Ukrainian forces are steadily picking their way forward. It's not quick. It's not going to be quick yet. Um, you actually need to see, they need to find a gap. They need to find somewhere where there's not so many mines, where the soldiers have maybe run away, and where they can actually break through. And that, that may or may not be around Zaporizhne, because equally, it could be in front of Donetsk, it could be around Bakhmut, it could even be further up in Lehman. But so we don't really know where the enemy will break. Uh, we just have to wait and watch the boys do their business and support them 
as much as possible until they until they get that breakthrough. But my other question was why there's a difference uh, of uh, uh, accepting the situation on the battlefields from the points of view of the generals uh, on the battlefield. I mean, uh, the Ukrainians expert and the war expert and the experts from outside our country, the, the Western uh, or Eastern European or even from the USA. Well, it's, it's simple. The, the, the generals on the battlefield are fighting. They see it. The generals outside the battlefield only get the, and I'm going to say it, and I'll say it once, the appalling, appalling strategic communications coming out of the Ministry of Defence, where there's total secrecy, where they don't let anybody know what's going on, so they can't make a judgment. Maybe Miley gets it from, from, from Zaluzhny, but nobody else gets anything. They have to guess. And so when you guess, you get things wrong. When you know what's going on, you can actually, maybe some of the generals can give wisdom and help. But I can assure you that there are some generals who are willing to give wisdom and help who nobody talks to at all. For example, Ben Hodges, who was US Army Commander Europe. He did not get there by fresh air. He got there by being a really good general. Does anybody ever ring him and say, what are you doing tomorrow? Would you like to come and have a talk to us? And the answer is no. So what do you get? You get differences of opinion of generals who've never fought a war like this, who've only, only you know, done Afghanistan or Iraq, and they were both very, very different types of war. And then you've got your generals who are actually uh, pretty close to the front line and seeing what's going on. They will have different opinions. I plan to talk about it a little bit later, and we will talk about it more detailed a little bit later in our discussion. But as soon as we uh, touched this uh, um, question, I wanted to, to understand uh, that uh, from what you say, uh, these uh, uh, m m opinions uh, somehow affect uh, the decisions of politicians uh, in order what kind of weapons and uh, technical supply they should or can provide to Ukraine, according well, uh, to the uh, situation uh, on the battlefield? No, not no? according to the situation. Okay. According to what, what is asked for by the Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. Remember that you have this Ramstein meeting and then Reznikov goes to the Ramstein and says, this is what we want. And in many cases, I can, I can tell you in many cases that what is asked for by the Ministry of Defense doesn't actually necessarily agree with what other people outside think is needed. Uh, for example, drones. I mean, you, you heard Reznikov saying wedding drones were not needed. Well, 10,000 a week or whatever, you know, wedding drones are needed. They are the fundamental thing that keep, keep soldiers alive on the battlefield because they allow them to see. And, and it, it, so here you have a, a, a complete difference within your own system, a public difference within your own system, where the soldiers are saying, we need this, and where a Minister of Defence stands up and says, we don't need this. So how do you expect foreign countries to actually to understand? Because they can read Facebook as well, and do read Facebook, and do read what soldiers are writing. How can you expect them to understand when they read one thing, and then they hear something else? They do their best in most cases to provide what is available and to provide what the Ministry of Defence asks for. Um, and sometimes those things are going to be different. Availability is not always what Ministry of Defence asks for. What is available in countries? Sometimes because it's in store, sometimes because it's old and broken, sometimes because they no longer have it. Um, and I mean, you, you saw the, the arguments about about uh, the tanks. It took a long time to get everybody to understand yeah. we can't just pull tanks out of nowhere. Most of them are in store that we're going to give, and they need renovation before they before they go anywhere. Now, this raises lots of arguments about the West and its ability to go to war as well, arguments which are raging inside ministries of defense at the moment. But But that's why you get these differences. There are differences of what interpretation, differences of availability, differences of what's asked for. I see. Somewhere in the middle is a line. Yeah, I see. So let's get back a little bit to the tactics of what's going on on the battlefield right now. I want to add some more quotes from Colin Cull, uh, who recently departed uh, as the Pentagon's top policy official, described the Ukrainians as deliberately 
probing for weak spots across the east and south of the country. The real, his, his quote, the real test will be when uh, they identify weak spots uh, or create weak spots and generate a bridge, uh, how rapidly they're able to exploit that uh, with the combat power that they have uh, in reserve and how rapidly uh, the Russians will be able to respond, Carl said, uh, not long ago uh, on a briefing with reporters. So my question is, for how long can such a period uh, usually be in the military tactics? And in your estimation, what could be the result of this tactic? Well, uh, the how long is as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's not put time on this. If it takes till the winter, it takes till the winter to get a breakthrough. Um, uh, you, you, can't, you can't rush war. You can only conduct it. You know, this is not like a marathon where you have a fixed point at the end. There's no fixed point in this. There is just an activity that you keep doing and keep doing and keep doing until something breaks or until the enemy breaks you because of Russia might actually do something that we're not expecting. But, but you know, people must understand that. But OK, but what he's saying is, is pretty much correct in that the, 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 the forces are looking for a weak, a weak spot. They're looking for a breakthrough point. Then it is going to be how quickly can we shift one, two, three, however many brigades the staff decide, uh, the, the solution decides to push through, however many of those brigades through that gap into the space behind. Then the war changes, because once you're behind Russians, they have a history of running away. You saw this in, you saw this around Kharkiv, that once, once 93 Brigade got round Izium, then the boys ran and left everything. And I think that that will happen again. But they have to get behind first. And what they're doing is trying to find that gap at the moment, probing for that weak spot. Um, and, and the, you know, how long does it take to get a Brigade to that weak spot? Oh, it's not easy. It might take a few days. Um, and, and it might even take a week or more because you've got to move tanks and everything and fuel them, fuel them again just before they go through the gap. Then you've got to take your logistics through the gap. This is not easy. And people need to read the advance from the beaches towards Berlin in the Second World War mm. and read that and look at all the, all the, 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 the problem areas deciding, where, because if the gap is in, a, in the place where you're not expecting it, do you take it? You know, what happens if the gap is right near the north? Do we take it and then have to go all the way down the back of Donetsk? Or, or, or what do we or do we go into Donetsk? These things are not easy. They are not guaranteed. And you have to, you have to, you know, take your chances and, and then drive as hard as you can towards the enemy and make him run, 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 run. Because if you don't make him run, he stops, he gets back into trenches, he puts more mines, and you have to do it all over again, which is quite a possibility. Okay, let's have a look a little uh, on the uh, behavior of Russian army on the battlefield uh, since one year of the war passed. Uh, how quickly, how quickly does the Russian army respond to changes uh, in the tactics of the Ukrainian troops? And uh, by what means they do it? They mimic or they just do whatever they can uh, having the arsenal and understanding of the situation, how they can it. I think it's a combination because I, I don't see any um, consistency across the battlefield. Um, so you've got, it depends to a large degree who the general is, which area they're in, and what the quality of the troops are. Because some of the Russian troops, uh, the Russian organized troops that have been around a long time, they respond and change much better than the boys just coming in who've not had any training, for example. So you can't, you can't sort of say, that Russia is doing this, but there are there are, some of them are learning lessons, and certainly at the strategic level, they are learning lessons, um, and quite quickly in some cases. <clears throat> so one one should not underestimate them in that, um, and their, their tactics, they certainly learn to, to fight differently around Bakhmut, um, uh, but but then you know then they pull Wagner out, and now that seems to have, seems to have stopped. 
So it's you can't you know you can't tell who who was who was making the changes. It's impossible to tell when we're when you're from outside when you're actually looking at that looking at the army. Um, but what is quite clear is that they are they're not giving up. Now, one of the things about character, the Russian character, which is that that they they are in cultural terms they have high uncertainty avoidance. In other words, they like things to be clear and and structured and certain. So when you're facing an enemy like Ukraine, if you're facing him face to face, they can fight and they will fight very well and very hard. If the enemy goes behind them, then the uncertainty comes huge. And you saw this with the, the Wagner group going up the road to um, going up the road to, to, to Moscow is that uncertainty stopped anybody actually doing anything because oh, who's in charge? Who's the boss? Where's the boss? So if we can create that uncertainty with Russia again, by getting behind them, this will, is, is what will happen. The orders process will break down. It'll break down because they don't have enough radios, because everything is no longer linear, that, that, that things are doing this. And once they start doing that, they will fall apart because they can't do that very well. In fact, they don't like doing it at all at the moment. So the, the worst thing is actually hitting them head to head because that gives them total certainty. All I have to do is sit here and, and kill. Mm -hmm. So when they're behind, it changes. So this is this is this thing, and, and that's why they fight so well when things are certain. It's very simple. I have to stand here. I have to kill or die myself. Once it's in the head, you will see a different action from them. What about human resources? There's an interesting analytical article uh, on the Politica uh, portal, I mean, the, the, the site. Yes. Yes, and I want to quote uh, one uh, very interesting moment uh, out of this article. Kiev is beginning to sense thousands of well-trained uh, reinforcements, which uh, it had previously held in reserve during the beginning uh, stages of the counter-offensive to the front lines, uh, said one of of the officials, all of whom were granted anonymity to discuss a developing situation. One of Ukrainians' goals is to reach the Sea of Azov, about 60 miles south of Orihiv city, uh, cutting off Russian forces between the south and uh, east of the country, said the first uh, official uh, who commented this situation. So my next question is um, about another objective factor uh, is uh, one of them is difference in the amount of human resources on the battlefield that we talked right now with mm. you. So is it uh, very decisive in this situation, uh, the quantity and not the equal qu quantity and equality, uh, quality, I, I'm sorry, the quality of these uh, warriors, I mean, all the soldiers from Russian side uh, and from Ukrainian side. And how the situation, this factor will affect on the battlefield? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. And I mean, remember, remember, again, go back to the Second World War with some of the battles between Russia and Germany. Huge, huge numbers were encircled and captured. I mean, whole corps were encircled, you know, almost more than everybody on the battlefield in Ukraine and from Ukraine and Russia at the moment were captured. So th these things are about the ability of the, the ability of the army to do military maneuvers. If you do the military maneuvers right, you get behind the enemy, you capture them, or they run away or whatever. Okay, so so at that point, numbers don't matter. Because once once you get a break in the in the in the command structure in the organization, then then actually numbers become even more of a problem because you can't handle the numbers. It becomes a management problem that is beyond people. Mm -hmm. So this is this is this is going to be the true test of you know, Ukraine's generals, who at the moment have been fighting still in a, in a quite a Soviet manner of head to head. But th this war cannot be won by head to head fighting, because Russia will continue to find more people, continue to find more weapons, whether they're from Iran, whether they're from North Korea or whatever. So if it becomes a battle of mass versus mass, uh, big Soviet army versus small Soviet army, Ukraine is going to run out of energy in time. So Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukrainian generals have to start being uh, more flexible in the, in the attitude and the way that they fight and thinking about it. 
I think they are. I mean, you can see signs of it, but still those signs are still new signs. They're not signs that we've changed the whole business in a way that the West would like, which is why you saw the comment from the German generals. Um, I see, yeah. but, but but on the other hand, we a lot of times, especially during this uh, short period of counteroffensive, uh, continue to um, remind the politician of the world uh, that we need support from the air. That's why I want to add some more information about this. Uh, in if the offensive in Ukraine was led by the American army, it would rely on the support of aviation, which would destroy the enemy's uh, fortifications uh, long before sending infantry. Instead, the Ukrainian military suffers uh, from a lack of aviation and insufficient number of armored uh, vehicles and uh, artillery weapons, which leads to higher losses on the battlefield, according to American experts. So because there obviously is no way to Harry Potter you through the minefields, you have to literally go through it. So you will suffer lots of losses. The experts claim, however, I quote, the Americans would never have fought this way they would have carpet bombed entire minefields and lines of trenches long before sending even one soldier there. This is the end of the quote. So let's not forget about the NATO doctrine which says that any counteroffensive action take place exclusively with air support. Yes, we're not a NATO country, but Ukraine is fighting not only for its land and people. There's no doubt that Ukraine is protecting democratic values and the European Union countries bordering Russia from possible uh, in, in rich, in, in encroachments in the events uh, of uh, defeats in this war of civilization. So do Western countries of uh, the coalition still have any doubts about what exactly and how they are really justified? That is a very long and very complex question. I'm going to jump back. First of all, you cannot keep criticizing the West for giving you masses and masses and masses and masses of equipment when you sold all your equipment to other countries before this whole war started. Remember 2012, 2013. So yes, there has to be a balance of understanding about these things. The doctrine, the NATO doctrine, yes, it does say air power. And let's remember the first Gulf War of, of, of shock and awe for three days. Don't ask me why the Americans don't understand this for this war. I have no idea. But I can tell you that there are hundreds, literally hundreds of, of Americans, experts and, and generals who are complaining to uh, the White House and complaining to uh, other other governments about the lack of support for air. Now, why is this happening? Well, don't forget, Russia's not only got into Ukraine uh, and, and got at Ukrainian politicians, they've also got at politicians and security services in other countries prior to this war. So you've not just got the West, you've actually got an infiltrated West. Um, remember that Brexit, where did the money for Brexit come from? From Russia. So. There are people still, there are still structures and organizations that are favoring Russia, even on the Western side. This is a hybrid war. It's not just Ukraine, the West, and the West is all nice and rosy and doesn't love Ukraine. This is more, much more complex than people, especially in Ukraine, understand uh, of, of what is going on outside of this. Why is there no air cover? cowardice in my view and i will say that publicly i think it's cowardice i think people should have jumped at this straight away as soon as the war started they should have realized that if we're going to support we have to support to a proper nato doctrine and they didn't now we are where we are and it's not a, it's not a nice place in many areas it's not a nice place in many things and, and this is why you see tension, which is why you see tension between politicians and generals and differences of views. It's so complex. We are, we are absolutely thankful. We are absolutely thankful for all the uh, support and help from our Western uh, allies and Western countries. And without you, 
uh, I don't know, nobody knows where we could be right uh, now. And well, we do, we do know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but, we but, do know. but, yeah, but uh, on the other hand, I cannot, uh, just to be objective, remind uh, uh, about, I understand that it sounds banal right now, but anyways, we had Budapest Memorandum. We gave away no, our nuclear did. weapon. Yeah, we, did. we believed in the security guarantee of four um, major countries uh, at that period of time. And uh, let's go uh, further in the history. I mean, uh, from the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine, and I remind you, and you know about this, in 2014, so uh, the world didn't stop putting uh, on the border of uh, Ukraine when he tried to capture Crimea. But before this was Georgia in 2008, and they didn't oh, stop Putin that time. And the first uh, um, uh, pipe, uh, the, the, the uh, North, North Stream, North Stream 1, was being built at that period of time, even though the war in Georgia. And so afterwards, it was Nord Stream 2 during the war, and the Baltic countries and the representatives of the countries and the Parliament European were shouting out, don't do this. It's very threatful. It's very threatful because you are given the power and uh, the weapon into the hands of Putin, but nobody stopped them. So this might be maybe the mutual um, fault I, I, even though you remind us that we were yeah. selling weapons uh, before this period. Okay, it's a fact, but these are facts too. Don't you yeah, agree? Yeah, they are. They are. And, and, and it's, you know, it, it's, you could say it's a stupidity on both sides. Um, it, for, we've been at peace for too long. That's the first thing. And because we've all been at peace, everybody thinks peace is the, is the you know, the normal. Well, and, and why didn't we wake up when? Hey, come on! Not even Georgia, Chechnya. Yeah. Look at look at look at Chechnya. I mean, I actually I used the expression um, uh, years ago uh, uh, to, to, of how Russia would fight, and I said that you know places would be groznified, and people actually laughed at me for that for that sort of that word. But that's exactly what. That's exactly what they did to Mariupol. That's exactly what they did to Bucha. They groznified. They just destroyed everything. And, and, you know, why haven't Western politicians understood this? Uh, some are bought. I mean, you've seen, you've seen, you know, that, that, that's, uh, p people working for Gazprom, politicians working for Gazprom, politicians getting backhanders, as I said, uh, Russian money for, for Brexit. Uh, and, and all these things that, that we we haven't grasped that Russia has been trying to undermine us for all of us, not just Ukraine, but all of us for a long time. I'm sorry to say it's just that the West is still in a, a more comfortable place than Ukraine. And because it's still in a more comfortable place, it's a lot harder politically to actually to explain to, to, to the public that, you know, we're at war. We're at war, and and you can see in America they don't understand that at all. Uh, in the White House, it's they're not at war. They're at war ten minutes a day when they talk about Ukraine. Um, and what should we give Ukraine next? They're not in it with you in the same way that perhaps the you know the Baltic states feel this. Poland feels this. You know, Poland feels the pain. It's next door. Um, so there's there's all these problem areas and, and political worrying areas that have not grasped yet that Russia's in this for the long haul mm -hmm. and it's in it to destroy the West and Africa and everywhere else it can. Okay, let's get back to the question of uh, the support from the sky. And um, I want to ask you in this situation that I... Um, uh, reminds it uh, about the doctrine of NATO that counteroffensive uh, uh, operations uh, uh, conducted only with the help of aircraft. Okay, what's the situation with this process of transferring uh, aircraft F-16 to Ukraine by some countries that are ready to give us, but someone stopped them, and we understand that our uh, pilots are uh, ready to uh, learn to operate this AF-16 aircrafts very fast, much faster than it uh, they, they supposed are, but to you don't, They yeah. are, but okay. you don't have any means of maintaining them. You can't even maintain your own aircraft at the moment to the same level that other people do 
on operations. So the amount of flights that you're flying is compared to the number of aircraft you've got is extremely low. Um, now, there could be all sorts of reasons for this, but I suspect a large amount of it is the ability to maintain the aircraft. So they're, they're, and if you have difficulty maintaining uh, aircraft of the old type, which are very simple, you will have double and treble the amount of problem, of challenge maintaining F-16, um, because it is quite a complex aircraft. Okay, let's, I mean, forgetting that, you get it. You've still got to maintain it. You've still got to actually to 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 to, to have a, a system that allows you to get the right spares that you need quickly. You do not have that system inside of the Ministry of Defence. You, you, you've got terrible troubles with your procurement, um, and and you know this. This is public again, and you need for something like F sixteen. You need a responsive system where you can actually say, I need the part, and the part comes within hours. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that F-16 is off the road. You can't use it again. Mm -hmm. um, and and <laughs> you don't have that system yet. So part of the American work and part of other countries' work is, that, is a trying to actually to put a system in place to allow you to be able to keep F-16 flying. You can't... It's not like tanks. You can't just take it back to to Poland. If it's broken, it's broken. And where it's broken in Ukraine, you can't put it on a low loader and drive it back to Poland and get it fixed. You've got to fix it in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, you have difficulty actually fixing things like tanks in Ukraine, and they have to go back to Poland. So just think on this. It's not so easy as it sounds. It's not just about flying it. It's about getting it ready to fly Yes, your pilots are brave. Yes, they'll learn it quickly, and some of them are learning it quickly. One of the questions, that, one of the questions that can be decided right now: we can use the airports of Poland and Romania, and these sites are ready to provide us this uh, no, opportunity. No, of no. course you can't. No, of course you Why can't. Why not? No, because you've got to fly over the whole length of Ukraine, and by the time you get to the battle area, you'll only have two minutes there, and then you've got to fly back again. Mm -hmm. All right, you can't, and if you, you need to do air-to-air -air refueling if you want to play this sort of game. Otherwise, you're not going to have any time over the battle area. So you can't use, you can't start flight where well, you can fly from Poland, but then you're at high risk because what happens if you have to fight over the air? You haven't got any fuel for fighting. Okay, the, the, these, these aircraft are not designed to fly. Remember how far it is from Poland to Donetsk. Just measure it, oh. you know, and if you've got a loaded, if you're loaded with weapons, you burn fuel quite quickly. Okay, just to resume uh, this point of uh, our uh, conversation, um, I just want to know and understand if there's any alternative ways until we get this uh, help from air support aircraft, because you understand and uh, Europeans mm -hmm. understand, we understand that each day it's a lives, lives of real people who stand still and waiting for this aircraft support. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 and the first thing about the aircraft support, I mean, the, the, actually the Russians are not flying as much as one could expect them to. Um, the first thing is you need to get we need to get better close air defense for, for the for the Ukrainian brigades. So they need more close air defense. And I know that Germany is trying to actually to produce some more close air defense weapons and other other uh, countries are trying to actually to produce more close air defense. So so that it becomes more difficult for for the air, air aircraft to come over the battle area. That, the same against helicopters, not just against uh, not just against fixed wing. So that's one thing. The second thing is is using artillery to actually to try and devastate the the the, um, the minefields. And and the, the the cluster bomb artillery is is more useful for that than and multi barrel rocket launchers. But that means that you've got to have really sharp coordination between the the infantry brigade and the artillery. And that, that actually is something that the, the, the soldiers on the front line have been talking about, this need for greater coordination. So you can do that. Um, but it, 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 again, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, re remove or reduce the 
the, the, the positiveness that you would get from F, F-16. But you're not going to win a war with F-16. Remember this. F-16 is merely another weapon system. It's an enabler. The, the, the bottom line is that this, this war will only be won by soldiers, soldiers walking and soldiers fighting in trenches and working their way forward. Um, F-16 just allows them to do their job a bit better. Okay. And even then, it's got mm -hmm. to be in the right place at the right time. And that, again, is another complex activity that has to, that has to take place. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look a little bit into the nearest future. And I want to add uh, the information about uh, the overview of this future. So now the debates in the capitals of the West mainly go around how to end this war in such a way so for Ukraine to be secure for its future and not to be attacked by Russia in the next three or five years or so. So are any realistic effective ideas already the Western countries have? No. No? Okay. <laughs> short question, short answer. Okay. So, by the way, NATO countries ready to respond to a possible real provocation towards Poland or one of the Baltic countries because uh, there have been no such precedents uh, since the end of the World War II. Mm. This is more uh, uh, actual uh, key points for you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that NATO has got to, uh, for the simple reason that if NATO doesn't respond, let's say Wagner Group decides to uh, drive into the try into the Savolki corridor and capture it, well, good luck to them. It's a horrible area down there. Um, if they try to do that, then NATO has to respond. Um, and and I, I mean, I can tell you, it's no secret that most of the, the, the foreign troops on, on those NATO countries have been given very clear instructions by their government that that you know if 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 Russia does this, you fight. Um, there there won't be much ringing back to head to to to, to governments and saying ooh, ooh, what do we do. Um, so NATO has to fight because if NATO doesn't fight, there is no NATO. I think we have to be clear about that. NATO would just fall apart because because the the, the, it, it, the very essence of this is that you defend each other. And if you don't defend each other, there is no essence anymore. It will be conventional answer. Oh, yeah. And uh, nobody's going to fire nuclear weapons at, at Russia unless they, they do something completely stupid. And I think that, you know, R Russia knows that even if they fire a tactical nuclear weapon somewhere, that the, the reply is almost certainly going to be com conventional because the NATO air power across all the countries is so has got so much air power that it can destroy what the Russians have got on the front line quite quickly. Then you ask, well, why don't they do that now? It's a good question. Let's talk about the real risk and real threats that is pronounced uh, by uh, the dictator uh, Lukashenko. Uh, and uh, actually, it's the words of Putin, I think, because Lukashenko is not independent mm. personality. Anyway, no. uh, Radio Svoboda of Belarus counted uh, 750, 754 pieces of equipment in the camp of Wagner's uh, uh, company in the village of uh, Tsel near Osipovici, including 62 trucks, uh, 534 cars of various types, uh, th 33 buses, 99 trucks, uh, and uh, 26 trucks or uh, armored vehicles. This amount can be seen in the photo from July 25th. Uh, the amount of equipment around the camp is growing rapidly. Journalists note that uh, um, compared to the July 19th photo, the equipment increased uh, by approximately 2,069 units. So according to estimates uh, of the monitoring group Belarusian Gayun, uh, 11 Wagner vehicles convoys arrived uh, uh, into the country. This is more than 700 units. So the last column arrived on the evening of the July 25th and uh, uh, consisted of at least uh, 29 cars. So what could be the mission of Wagner Group uh, in uh, in out of the territory of Belarus, uh, and is that potential threat to uh, the uh, Poland's uh, border, for example, and how it can be? Well, let's be clear, 800 units is one brigade, one Western brigade. In fact, it's probably less than an American heavy brigade. I mean, as a battery commander in the artillery, I had 38 units just in one battery. So our regiment was 200, the artillery regiment was over 200 vehicles. 
Okay, so 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 we're not look, you're not looking at anything clever. No, not nearly two hundred. You're not looking at anything clever there. You're looking at a brigade's worth of vehicles. Um, and and I just add to that. That's a brigade worth worth of vehicles that they've never trained on. They, they, they haven't done any armoured exercises, driving around, actually working. And so they've got the vehicles. Have they got the radios? Have they got the all the other weapon that you need? Have they got the surveillance equipment? Have they got the drones? And the answer to that is, is probably no at the moment. And when you get that sort of stuff, you still need quite a bit of time to actually to train before you actually know what you're, how you're working with each other. Because this is a new unit. And new units do not actually fight very well when they start. So we've got time to see the Wagner Group. And if they go to, if they all just load them up in vehicles and drive across the border, they will get uh, eaten up by by both the ground and by the, by the trained units that are on the other side. Because remember, the NATO units in, in in Poland, in Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, they have all been training solidly now for the last few years. And they do a lot of training, and it's quite aggressive and serious. So I don't think one brigade's worth of Wagner vehicles and lots of semi-trained people is, is actually going to worry them. Yes, it can be bloody. Yes, there can be a nasty fight, but but it's not it's not something that's um, it's not something that's about to, to to create a new front. Not not mm-hmm. not without huge risk of involving NATO. And do they want to do that? I don't think so. Even with the use of uh, Belarus army, because uh, from our uh, <laughs> our conversations with the experts, Belarus uh, nation, the Belarus people and Belarus army, not the top generals uh, in the environment of Lukashenko, but just the, the simple plain soldiers are not uh, uh, such uh, crazy as uh, most of the Russian representatives for now, brainwashed by Russian propaganda. Propaganda. So there are much more uh, adequate people that understands that this is a suicide, yeah. suicide. So yeah. you think so? I agree. I agree. And most of them are pretty, pretty uh, poorly trained as well. Um, they've done very little what we would in the West would call uh, battle training. So and when you actually say it's only forty thousand strong, start taking away all the people in headquarters. Start taking away the logistics. Start taking away the people in the air force and everywhere else. The number of fighting soldiers in Belarus is extremely low. Um, and as you say, they don't want to fight. They've made that pl- they've made that plain at many levels. Um, you know, Belarusians do not consider themselves Russians. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so whatever Lukashenko says, I do not see that many of them are going to follow his his grand plan with any enthusiasm. One remember more. what? Okay, yeah, yeah. Remember, well, remember what Italians were like in the sec in the Second World War when they went under pressure, they gave up. But there's still one more threat, and it's uh, actually doubtful by some experts. So I want to ask you about this. The uh, Defense Intelligence uh, Agency, DIA, uh, has no reason to doubt that Russian President Vladimir Putin claims that Russia has moved a first batch of tactical nuclear weapons uh, to Belarus, uh, senior DIA official said on Friday, uh, lately. I mean, uh, is it a real threat? Because uh, some Lukashenko by himself was showing off Uh, at the cameras of uh, his television about uh, the existence of uh, nuclear weapon on the territory of Belarus and his threats about Poland when he said that this Wagner group are planning to make uh, a visit or touristic visit towards Poland. All this rhetoric of Lukashenko and uh, from the point of view of Putin, I understand. But uh, on the other hand, uh, is it bluffing? Because we thought about bluffing uh, uh, that he will move this uh, nuclear weapon to the territory of Belarus, but it's already on the territory of Belarus. Okay, I mean, I, I could tell a couple of stories about that from years ago about weapons in, in Belarus, but it's it's not it's not worth it, worth it at the moment. But but you've got you've got two things: you've got capability and you've got intention. Okay. I mean, remember first of all on capability that Russia actually borders Estonia. Uh, and uh, and Latvia, so it or, and Finland, so it already borders NATO countries. So if they want to fire nuclear tactical nuclear weapons, they can do so. They don't need to ship them into Belarus. What does it What does it give them by putting them into Belarus? Not not much more than they had before. So operationally, there's no real 
there's no real need to put these weapons in there. So the next game then is theatre. And, and, you know, then, then you're looking at theatre. Well, this is clearly theatre. Why is it theatre? I have no idea, any more than I had any idea of Prigozhin's theatre or real understanding. They are playing a lot of theatre at the moment. And what does the theatre do? It eats up the West's energy. It eats up the West's uh, analysts. They start writing about theatre. Um, and I think it is still theatre. Because if he decides to fire or even make, get Belarusia to fire, the West will see Belarusia as part of Russia. They will not say, oh, it's in Belarusia, we're not going to do anything. So it doesn't make any difference. And Belarusia has not got these weapons. Russia has got these weapons inside Belarusia. So they're not Belarusian weapons, they are Russian weapons with Russian control, and Belarusians will not get their hands on them at all. So, it's, so Lukashenko hasn't got them. He's just allowed more Russians inside his own country, um, uh, which, which means he loses power even more. But still, this theatre uh, continue to um, threaten some politicians uh, and uh, stopping them from the maybe radical decisions, even about the providing some uh, well, sort of weapons. It's theatre, but still it threatens theatre. Yes, it In is. what situation it... you think uh, it might be used? Because we were talking about uh, this last chance or the last card in the hands of Putin to stop counteroffensive. But as for we observe, the situation is quite slowly on the battlefield, but still, can it be used to stop the counteroffensive if no. it will be more faster and more um, obviously effective? No. no. No, because it's a tactical nuclear weapon. It's actually quite small. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons are quite small. And so if you fire five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten, you're going to cause as much damage to your own side as you are to the enemy. Um, uh, you know, we, we, I, I was, I was a, a troop commander in a tactical nuclear weapon unit in Germany in, in, in the Cold War. And we used to call it a boomerang. Because if you fired it, you were going to get your own mess back at you. And because the weather doesn't, you know, the wind, God, God decides where the wind's going to go, not Putin. And so you can fire one of these, the wind can change, and all the, the shit goes in your direction. Uh, and so it's, it's not a very clever weapon to use or to even think about using. Could he use it in last resort? That it's the last resort for him, isn't it? it means the war is over for him, not just for us. It's over for him because the West will then have to intervene. You know, the argument about the wind towards their own uh, borders and towards their own country doesn't work because one, from what we observe, uh, the situation with the Zaporizhia nuclear power plants, completely mined by uh, the uh, Russian uh, uh, occupiers right now. And this is very um, threatening situation. It's, it's, it might yes. be a, a, another catastrophe, not only in Ukraine, but on uh, the European continent. They don't think about the winds and its direction no, towards no, their country. No, they don't. It, can, it <laughs> can be used like a weapon to stop the counteroffensive or any other maybe uh, uh, actions of Ukraine uh, uh, soldiers and, or, or army or not? No, it can't. It can't because Why? you just go around the, Why are you you so go around sure? the outside. Because I've been studying this for 50 years. You just go around the outside. It is a large bomb that's dirty. It's only the same. It has. There's more power mm -hmm. with tactical nuclear weapons. There is more power in the engine, in the fuel, than there is in the actual warhead. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that. So to actually just throw it where you've got to throw it, there's more physical energy in the engine than there is in the, in, in the warhead. Now, when it goes off, it's going to make a very big hole and a very nasty disaster. But Ukraine is a huge country. You would need lots and lots and lots of them. And the moment you fire one of those, the war has changed. So the counteroffensive will change. It. it will change for the Russian army as well. They're not all going... None of them have got... None of them have got nuclear chemical dress. Okay, so they're not sitting there with their helmets and everything else. They haven't got any. So what are they going to do when a nuclear weapon goes off in front of them? Blinds all those who haven't been told it's going to be fired because they will be blinded. What's going to happen to all the Russian soldiers? Most of them are going to get up and go home 
because they don't want to fight in something like this. They're not going to stand there with their eyes closed, blinded, saying, oh, that was jolly good. That stopped the counteroffensive. This is, this is not a game that, is, <laughs> that you can play unless you are an extremely, extremely sophisticated army with all the right equipment. In the Cold War, we all had the right equipment. If we see the Russians issuing the front line with this equipment, then maybe we'll understand that someone's about to do something. But at the moment, it would cause as much damage to their own side as it would cause to the, the Ukrainians, almost certainly. Otherwise, they're not firing at the counterattack. They're firing somewhere else. But, you know, returning uh, from the battlefield from Ukraine, if they are happy to return somehow home to Moscow, not to Moscow, okay, to so the far, far away region from the, Moscow, without hands, Siberia. without legs, without eyes, without brain, whatever. It doesn't stop the others from uh, finding a way to no. avoid. They don't make, they will not make a riots in the, the Russian Federation, but they still believe in some illusionary uh, fascist yeah. things or other stupid things that continue to uh, get into the heads of Russians through the television, still continue, even though uh, the lots of uh, evidence is that it's not everything according to the plan of Putin far, far away from the plan of Putin, but they still believe somehow. Yeah, because Putin's deity is a god. This is religion. I mean, you know, it always has been. You know, the Tsar is the god. And Putin is the god, it's religion. Therefore, whatever he says, he can't do anything wrong. Uh, okay, some of the oligarchs who are, who are Western educated, they understand, of course, he can do things wrong. And they may not be very happy with this. But... But, they're, they're, you know, none of his close coterie of oligarchs are going to be very happy at the thought of uh, we nuclear weapons being fired. Remember how many of these people around Putin have got their families in the West, in the Netherlands, in Britain, in Monaco, lots of them. Are they really, really going to want to start a nuclear war where their children and wives are killed? I don't think so. One more very uh, difficult question, but still I want to stress on it and um, want to hear your um, point of view. In a number of cases, Western politicians still give weapons to Ukraine, uh, even against the opinion of their military. Ukraine, tragically, and it is a tragedy that this has had to be the case, uh, has become a battle lab. I therefore welcome that many allies will today commit to providing long-term security assistance to Ukraine. This will help deter any future aggression from Russia after this war ends. Et donc nous avons décidé de livrer de de nouveaux missiles permettant des frappes dans la profondeur à l'Ukraine. But on the other hand, sometimes they say the uh, following or argument: supporting Ukraine is a great idea, but first decide how you will replenish our own arsenals and equipment and fleet. We talked about this uh, in the beginning of our conversation, but still, I want to remember one the conversation uh, and an interview on uh, Deutsche Welle uh, television that journalist of this uh, tele channel, uh, TV channel, uh, asked uh, uh, German deputy in an interview. Uh, with the same arguments. Are you going to continue the war on your own territory, I mean, the German territory? So is this question relevant for other European countries and uh, particularly from Eastern Europe? Can it really be possible, the war with the NATO country in the nearest future? Oh, I think you've asked more than one question there. I mean, I think you need to go back to this thing about, you know, why do generals say... Um, don't give away all our weapons. Well, that's understandable because, because someone might actually ask them to fight. And if you've taken away all their weapons and then you ask them to fight for NATO they, and they can't do it, they lose their jobs and, and everybody will blame them. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a degree of tension between the military wanting to keep their military ability as an organization and the politicians who see, maybe see the wider picture. Um, But, but, you know, most of the Eastern European countries have given up uh, huge amounts of their, of their firepower. I mean, Latvia has given, effectively given all its air, air defense weapons, I think all its anti-tank weapons, and they are relying upon 100% upon America being able to actually come and fight 
for them if something goes wrong. Mm. So you're getting huge support from from you know Estonia, Latvia, and places, and they they are relying on the the overall strength of NATO um, to allow them to give you a lot of stuff. Um, I think the, the the weakest one in many ways is America because America has still got huge amounts more equipment sitting in the desert that they could give you, um, and I still don't understand why. They haven't actually started pulling a lot of that out because they're never going to use it in their own army. They're never going to expand and use this old, these old weapons um, because they're, they're, it's, they're just not going to. So, so they're, they're, I'm surprised America hasn't given you more. But NATO fighting, only if they're attacked. I don't see any political change on the horizon or hear of any, anything else. So maybe my final question will be about uh, your prediction. Uh, at what point, according to all the facts that we discussed right now, the counteroffensive might be stopped or finished by Ukrainian side? I mean, by our decision and our ability. I don't think you will. I don't think you will, because I think that the, 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 the mass of the population in Ukraine has decided this war has to be won. Uh, and I don't feel any any weakness in that. I do feel uh, I'm still suspicious about many, many of the people in government and parliament, uh, and I say so regularly, um, that, that they were more likely to give in and accept uh, the loss of Donetsk area and Crimea uh, and carry on as they are. But the, pu the public, the population is going to keep going. If it goes into another year or even another two years, I don't see people giving up yet i think there's a lot more to do and there's if anything i would say the resolve is getting stronger from people certainly amongst the women that is there is a much much stronger hardness amongst women in in, in ukraine about winning this war than than i felt maybe a year ago and one more thing you told me that uh, you don't see any decisions uh, um, that can be uh proposed to Ukraine in uh, um, a way of uh, um, security for the rest of three, maybe five years, for not letting Russia to uh, do it again with Ukraine after the war ends. You said no ideas right now. But, no. I, but I wanted to ask in this direction, yeah. uh, what mostly uh, threatens uh, the politicians that don't have such idea? The nuclear weapon and nuclear war globally? Uh, or the, no. the collapse of Russian Federation and all the sequences, consequences that might bring it to the world. And the grand crisis, the nuclear weapon in the other hands well, of crazy of people. Those, no. Neither of those things. Neither. neither of those things. Their own political careers and their own parties and their own future in their own country. Mm -hmm. Selfishness, Selfishness above all. I'm sorry, but, you know, people... people it's like... You know, Russians think that the world should respect them. Ukrainians think that everybody should be thinking about them and the Russia war. They're not. You, you, you know, look at where the politicians go on holiday from other countries uh, uh, and what they're doing and how many of them stand up and talk about Ukraine regularly. You've got a great bunch in UK in the parliament, strong, very powerful, and they do. But I tell you, there are an awful lot of politicians who give Ukraine five minutes a day. Still because they don't believe they're at war. And until, until the West gets hurt, they won't believe they're at war. It will carry on in the same way that it's going at the moment. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your honest answers. Uh, obviously, thank you very much for the help of the countries of European uh, world uh, in uh, standing still here in Ukraine, independence yeah. with our soldiers and our army. And uh, obviously, thank you for your um, optimistic perspective that you... Yeah, we're, going, that you we're going to win. We are going to win. Yeah. It just may take a little longer than we want. That's all. We will. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. I Not want I want to remind that the guest of our this uh, episode was the Glenn Grant, uh, retired British lieutenant colonel, and uh, as um, for now and me as well, 
I have to say goodbye to you. I'm Ksenia Smirnova, and it was my show Talk for More Details. If you like this episode, press like button. If you didn't like it, write in the comments why. And press the bell to be the first to see the most up-to-date information. And don't forget to subscribe to The Gaze platform on YouTube and our social networks. Thank you and keep in touch.